Uh, I want to talk about some work we have been doing here over the last six years or so, trying to understand what privacy means at an operational level so that we can develop algorithms and tools that organizations can use to enforce privacy protection. And uh, much of the initial work was at an intellectual fundamental level, but now we have gotten to the point where we are beginning to get some transitions to industry with some active ongoing interactions with uh, Microsoft and Symantec. Uh, Joy's talk and the questions towards the end of the previous talk really set up this topic nicely. As personal information is moving more and more online in digital form to various companies who are using it for uh, profit, privacy expectations are becoming a major concern in society and really the research challenge that this work addresses is how can we help ensure that organizations respect privacy expectations in the collection, use, and disclosure of personal information. To make things concrete, let's look at a healthcare privacy setting. Imagine a patient who comes to a hospital, shares their personal information with a physician, expecting that that information will be used to provide treatment. The physician might share that information further within the organization to enable a use of that information for the purpose of treatment. But if the nurse in this example turns around and sells that information to say a drug company for marketing without the consent of the patient, then this information, uh, then the privacy expectations of the patient would be violated. So one thing I want to point out at this point is that the threats here are from authorized insiders individuals in organizations who have a legitimate reason to have access to the personal information, but might abuse that right to use that information in ways that do not respect privacy expectations. So we do not expect traditional security measures like preventive access control measures to be sufficient to guard against these threats. Access control-like measures are necessary to keep outsiders out, but that's not going to be sufficient. And in fact, what the practice that has emerged in industry even is to use, to employ auditors who check that the behavior of authorized insiders is compliant with privacy expectations. And these privacy expectations could be ones that come from regulations in sectors like healthcare, from laws like HIPAA and the state privacy laws, or in unregulated or self-regulated sectors these expectations are ones that are embodied in the privacy policies of companies. So if you look at Google or Facebook or Microsoft, the privacy expectations that I'm talking about are ones that are in their privacy policies. So the goal of the auditors is to check that internal uses by programs and people is not violating these policies. And sometimes these organizations are subjected to external audits. For example, the HHS recently mandated audits for a bunch of healthcare organizations in the US. And our goal here is to enable the job of these auditors to be easier to develop technology that can help with the process of checking compliance, with the process of detecting violations with uh, privacy policies and regulations. To make things a little more concrete, I want to give you an example of a privacy clause, a clause from the HIPAA privacy rule. It says that a covered entity, that's a hospital, may disclose an individual's protected health information to law enforcement officials for the purpose of identifying an individual. If the individual made a statement admitting participating in a violent crime that the covered entity believes may have caused serious physical harm to the victim. So it's a long and convoluted sentence, but part of the reason that I picked this one and not the other 84 that's in HIPAA, it's a huge complicated law, is that it illustrates many of the concepts that cut across the board that are common to privacy policies, not just in the healthcare sector, but for uh, many other sectors as well, including financial sector, the web, and so forth. So what are the concepts? Notice first that there are actions that involve personal information, that operate on personal information that these policies govern. In this particular example, it's a transmission action, a disclosure action from a sender P1, a hospital in this case, a covered entity, to some recipient P2 containing some personal information M. Often the individuals who are sending and receiving information are organized into roles. In this case, the recipient is in the role of law enforcement official. 
The law governs a certain type of information, protected health information in this case. There are often temporal constraints in privacy policies. In this example, it's saying that in the past, a certain kind of statement was made, but other examples of temporal constraints are, are idioms like consent. If in the past the patient gave consent, it's okay to share information. Notification, if there's a breach, then within a certain amount of time, like 30 days, the consumers have to be informed about it. Also, there are more uh, vague concepts like purpose. So in this case, the disclosure is only permitted for the purpose of identifying criminal activity. There are also concepts like beliefs. I'm going to separate these classes of concepts into black and white concepts, meaning concepts whose meaning is straightforward to understand, but there will be challenges in enforcement, but the challenges do not arise in understanding what they actually mean. And then there are these gray concepts, which are really gray in the sense that questions of what it means for information to be used for a purpose or an action to be used for a purpose is not even clear. And we have to be very precise on what they mean in order to develop algorithms that can help detect violations of these kinds of policies. More broadly, this area is focused on formalizing privacy policies, understanding what they mean precisely enough. Often they are enforcing restrictions on how personal information flows and is used and enforcement of privacy policies based on audit and accountability mechanisms. So this parallels very much how the law works in practice. We have a law, but the enforcement of the speeding uh, limits is not done by making cars that cannot go faster than the speed limit, but by having uh, uh, an audit and accountability mechanism, a monitoring infrastructure that helps detect when the cars are speeding and mechanisms for uh, incentive, an incentive structure, punishments and so forth. And so there are various pieces of the puzzle. I'll focus mostly on detection in today's talk. We are not the only one who, is work, who are working in this area. There is related work at MIT and Stanford, although they are not exactly in the same uh, questions, although they are not focusing on exactly the same questions that we are. So in terms of detecting privacy violations, the, uh, the overall big picture here is that we go from policies like laws and corporate privacy policies and put them into a computer readable form. And in fact, we have done complete formalizations of the HIPAA privacy rule and the gram leach bliley Act for financial institutions. This was the first work that did the complete formalization. And then the audit box takes as input the, the, the privacy policy re written in this computer readable form and the organizational audit log that keeps track of who access what information, both programs and people, and then it outputs whether the policy was violated or satisfied. And mirroring the separation of the privacy policy concepts into black and white concepts and these gray concepts, we have two classes of algorithms. There, are, there is an algorithm that supports completely automated audit for the black and white policy concepts. And then there is uh, some, uh, a separate algorithm that we have been working on to help with enforcement or detection of violation of concepts relating to the purpose restrictions on information use. Uh, and this second class of algorithm is really tricky because we are essentially trying to understand the human psyche. Right? We are trying to understand whether this person accessed personal information for treatment or for some other reason. And while we are not quite there yet to completely uh, have the all-powerful oracle from the matrix, we are trying to approximate it with uh, ideas from, uh, ideas from uh, artificial intelligence. So let me first talk about this, uh, give you an overview of the first algorithm for auditing the black and white policy concepts. One of the central challenges for auditing in this setting is that audit logs tend to be incomplete. They do not always have sufficient information to make a complete determination about whether the policy is satisfied or violated. So this is in contrast to how access control decisions are made. So when we try to log into our machine, the computer usually has checks our credentials and comes back with a yes, no decision, telling us, yes, you have the right to access this resource, or no, that you don't. In contrast, since audit logs are incomplete, we do not always expect the auditing algorithm to be able to, to give a yes, no answer. So what we would like to have is an algorithm that despite this incomplete information, kind of gracefully deals with the incompleteness. And there are many sources of incompleteness. Of course, there's no information about the future in the log, and yet the future is relevant for determination 
of things like timely data breach notification. The log may not have enough information or the algorithm may not understand the information available to make determinations about whether an access was for an appropriate allowed purpose or not. Uh, sometimes logs are spatially distributed, sometimes logs are encrypted, and the algorithm doesn't have access to all the information in the log. Also because of privacy concerns, a different set of privacy concerns that the auditor may not, should not always have access to the entire uh, set of personal information. So the way we are going to deal with incompleteness in logs is to treat logs as three-valued structures where given a predicate, it will come back sometimes with a true or false answer, but sometimes with the answer that it's unknown, whether this policy or this part of the policy is true or false. And the way the audit algorithm therefore works is that it takes a log L and a policy phi as input, and instead of always coming back with a yes-no answer, it'll check as much of the policy as it pos possibly could, given the information in the log that it, un that it understands, and then it outputs a residual policy phi prime, which will be checked when the log is augmented with additional information. So in a sort of more visual representation of it, there's the log and the initial policy. Think of phi zero as HIPAA. The reduce algorithm runs on the current log, checks as much of the policy as it possibly can, given the information in the log, and then outputs the residual policy, which will be checked when the log is augmented with additional information. So this proceeds in rounds. Uh, let's say the audit happens every week or every month or every day, depending on the organizational policy. And at any intermediate point, we could invoke these external oracles to help resolve information that this particular algorithm doesn't understand. So for example, those relating to purpose and beliefs and so forth. So if you, if you go back to our example, and I don't want you to read the details on the slide, the one thing I want to point out is that when we represent this clause of HIPAA in this computer-readable language, there are the black and white parts of the policy, which are marked as black, and then there's the red parts, which are really the gray and white, uh, the gray concepts. And when we run reduce over this log, we expect that it will understand and evaluate the black parts on the slide, but the red parts will always live on in the residual policy and will be answered either by invoking human auditors or other algorithms that understand how to deal with these gray concepts. And there are various technical challenges in this algorithm, including uh, the ability to deal with this kind of quantification over infinite domains, like the set of all messages in the English language. We have an implementation and evaluation over simulated audit logs for compliance with all the 84 uh, disclosure-related clauses of the HIPAA privacy rule. And the average time for checking compliance of each disclosure was about 0.12 seconds for a 15 megabyte log. And that's one uh, attribute of how effective this algorithm is. The other is, does it really help? So one possible scenario, worst case scenario, is when the original policy just always lives on as the residual policy, meaning that the algorithm doesn't really help at all. But in the case of HIPAA, about 80% of all the atomic predicates can be automatically checked. So this algorithm does significantly help with, uh, with reducing the complexity of the task for the human auditor. We have a couple of ongoing transition efforts. Uh, we are integrating the algorithm into the Illinois Health Information Exchange and joint work with UIUC and the Illinois uh, HLN. And uh, we are also right now working with Symantec on auditing logs for compliance with policies. And this has led to some very interesting interactions both with the research and product groups at Symantec. Uh, in the remaining time, let me now transition to the second class of algorithm for dealing with uh, the purpose restrictions on information use. And this is another class of uh, uh, common uh, constraints that show up in privacy policies. Here are two examples. Yahoo's practice is not to use the content of messages for marketing purposes. And the Social Security Administration says that you consent to allow us to use the information only for the purpose for which it was collected. So we see at least these two classes of constraints on how personal information will be used for not for certain purposes or only for certain purposes, and they show up all over the place. So our goal is to give a semantics to these kinds of not for and only for purpose restrictions that's parametric in the purpose, meaning that should work for all purposes, and then to provide an algorithm that helps with automated enforcement. I want to give you a sense of the idea by running you through a very simple example. Imagine a healthcare setting where an x-ray is taken, and at that point, the technician has a choice, either to ship out that record 
to a drug company for profit, let's say. The, this interaction is governed by the policy that medical records are to be used only for diagnosis. So you expect that if that happened, the top branch in the slide was taken, then that action is not for the purpose of diagnosis because it was just sent out there for marketing, let's say. On the other hand, the technician could also add the x-ray to the medical record and then send it to a specialist for diagnosis. If this were to happen, then we expect that these actions are for the purpose of diagnosis. So whatever definition we come up with for what it means for an action to be for a purpose, this is a simple sanity check that we expect to be satisfied. So here's a candidate definition. We're going to say that an action is for a purpose if it is a necessary action in a sufficient sequence of actions for achieving the purpose. Now you see by this definition, the top action is definitely not for the purpose because it's not sufficient for achieving the purpose because you end up in a state where diagnosis is not achieved. The, the other two actions here do satisfy this definition because the, once the, uh, they are part of a sufficient sequence of actions for achieving the purpose because you eventually end up in the state over here where diagnosis is achieved. Also, if you remove any one of these actions from the sequence, diagnosis will no longer be achieved, which means that they are necessary. So this sounds like a reasonable uh, first cut at a definition, and in fact, it's very close to ideas of counterfactual ideas of causality that has been extensively explored both in philosophy and more recently in uh, computer science by Julia Pearl and others. But this idea doesn't quite work because here's a simple counterexample showing that although this record was sent to the diagnosis, uh, to the specialist for diagnosis, there is a small chance that the specialist might fail and not arrive at a diagnosis. So in this case, you do not achieve diagnosis. Does this mean that these two actions are not for diagnosis? That, does, that seems counterintuitive because clearly the intention was to achieve diagnosis. So the difference here is that in the previous uh, cut of the definition, I was saying that diagnosis has to be achieved and equating that with an action being for a purpose. Whereas here, we are saying that we would like to be able to say that an action is for a purpose if it was intended to achieve that purpose. And so how do you capture intention? We can capture intention by saying that at every choice point, the agent makes the best choice for achieving that purpose. So the best choice is not guaranteed to ensure that the purpose will be achieved, but that's the best one could hope for. And this leads to our thesis that an action is for a purpose if and only if that action is part of a plan for furthering that purpose. Where what I mean by a plan is that at every choice point, the agent makes the best possible choice. And this is more than a play on words because planning is something that has been well studied in the computer science literature and we can leverage all the technology that has been built to really scale up to large systems. And what I have been talking about with these bubbles and uh, arrows is really formally a Markov decision process and Markov decision processes are a standard model of planning. So our auditing uh, outline is that the algorithm will take as input the policy, the purpose restriction, the oddity's behavior as recorded in an audit log, and an environment model, which is this Markov decision model that tells us what choices were available to the agent. And it'll spit out whether the policy was obeyed or violated and might be inconclusive in some cases. So going back to our running example, the policy is that the medical record should be used only for diagnosis. And the audit log, if it records that the top branch was taken, where the record was shipped over to a, a drug company, uh, and this was the environment model showing the choices available, then we expect the, out the output of the algorithm is that the policy was violated. In fact, the way the algorithm works is quite simple. It solves the MGP and computes the optimal actions, optimal choices for each state and it just compares whether, whether the audit log records actions which could have been part of an optimal plan. And if the answer to that is no, then the policy implication is that the policy was violated. Now, there are three inputs to this audit algorithm. There is the policy, which we do have. The oddity's behavior is recorded in an audit log, which we also typically have in an organization. But the environment model, this MDP, if you go to a hospital or another organization and ask them to give them your, their MDP, they'll give you a blank stare. And so the question is, can that be somehow learned? And that's something that we also know how to do using standard reinforcement learning techniques. And the nice thing about this uh, algorithm is that it provides a sweet spot where the functional outcomes of the organization coincide well with protecting privacy. In fact, 
optimizing for these kinds of purposes also helps them achieve what they are really want to do, like improve healthcare outcomes. And in terms of ongoing transition efforts, we have been working with uh, Microsoft Research to check that, their, that the implementation of Bing, their search engine, respects its privacy policies pertaining to purpose restrictions on information use. And this work has been uh, start, started over the summer and has been a very exciting, uh, a very exciting both an application and further development of this set of ideas on how to enforce purpose restrictions and privacy policies. So let me stop with this big picture and I'll be happy to take any questions. And while I've been using examples from healthcare uh, and web privacy in this talk, the methods are very general the, and they apply to many other settings as well. We have also done work with the gram lich bliley Act for financial institutions. But the algorithms and the models have been developed in a very general form so they can apply in many other settings as well. Thank you. Yes. So if the goal is to determine whether the action was appropriate or not given the policy and the data, can you go over a little bit how the, the optimal MDP factors into it? Isn't it just a matter of yes, it was valid or not? I guess I didn't understand the optimizing of the MDP. Factor. Right. So, so there are two parts to the question, to, there, there are two parts to our thesis. There is the insight that what it means for an action to be for a purpose is that it should be part of a plan for achieving the purpose. So that's how we are trying to capture intention, right? So this is really about intention, not that the purpose was actually achieved, but whether the actions were done with the intention of achieving the purpose or was it done with some other intention, in which case it would be a violation, okay. right? And now the question is, how do you capture uh, planning? And so there are many different models of planning and different models might be appropriate in different settings. The MDP model is one particular model that we chose partly because it, it has worked very well in other settings, it, these things scale well. Uh, but if in an organization, if you're interested in human reasoning and so forth, you might need models for planning that are more tailored to human actors. So one thing that you may have noticed is that this optimization question becomes, a, it's, it has a strong assumption of a ra rational agent who has kind of logical omniscience, so we might want bounded rationality models or some other models that constrain uh, what the human knows. But the good thing about this is that, about the optimality criteria is that if it's violated, either it's really a violation of the policy, in which case you'd want to know about it from a privacy standpoint, or it's, a, it's, or it's an inefficiency in the system because maybe the agent did not make the best choice because they didn't know, in which case you would also like to know it so that you can improve uh, the efficiency of the system through training. 